Welcome to the Insights Podcast by UNSW Law Society. This week, we're joined by Natalie from Gilbert and Tobin, and we'll be exploring the world of intellectual property law. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Gadigal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded. Gilbert and Tobin is the leading law firm in transactions, regulatory and disputes. They handle some of the most complex transactions in Australia, advising acquirers, targets and financiers. The firm is committed to outstanding citizenship with pro bono legal services with a proud track record championing important causes such as marriage equality and reconciliation with Australia's Indigenous peoples. They also have the highest proportion of women partners among major Australian law firms. Gilbert and Tobin offers an excellent clerkship program each year that runs during the summer and allows penultimate or final year students to get a taste for working in a commercial law firm. Look out for applications around June each year. Thank you to Gilbert M. Tobin for sponsoring this episode and thank you Natalie for joining us today. Pleasure, thanks for having me. Awesome, let's jump into some introductions for you. Uh, Let's start with getting to know you a little bit more. How did you end up in IP law at Gilbert and Tobin? Sure, so um, I don't want to make it a long-winded story but I have had I guess a very non-traditional career path to becoming a senior lawyer at Gilbert and Tobin in the intellectual property team. Um, so before uh, I went to university, I actually wanted to be a classical musician. Oh, so okay. I auditioned for the Conservatorium of Music uh, and had law as my second preference, then realised, oh. I don't know if I really want to be rehearsing by myself <laughs> in a room for hours and hours right. on end. Um, yeah. So last minute decided to pursue law. Wow. And during law school, I absolutely loved intellectual property law as a subject yeah. because it's all about protecting um, authors of creative works. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was very much drawn to that as a subject matter. Yeah. Um, but I didn't apply for a clerkship. I was working in insurance litigation throughout law school. Um, but post law school, I moved to London the day after I got admitted. Wow. Um, and wanted to get into intellectual property law. So I was fortunate to work at Disney for a short stint. And then wow. I ended up at an um, intellectual property team of a white shoe firm in London. Okay. Um, and then moved back to Sydney. And um, yeah, always wanted to work at Gilpin wow. and Tobin because, um, yeah, during law school, they'd run the leading copyright cases, particularly okay. um, music online piracy. And, yeah. Um, so absolutely wanted to work at this firm. Wow, that's so interesting to hear that, like, you wanted something to do with music and you've kind of stuck out on the back end instead to support these yes. creators, which yeah. is lovely. I yeah. think I'm an example that if there's something that you're really passionate about, yeah, the subject matter, you sure. can absolutely follow it in your legal yeah. career. Wow, love that. So moving on to your key responsibilities here, what are they and what does a day in your life look like? Sure. So as a senior lawyer and the lead associate um, in each particular case I'm running, so yeah. my practice evolves around copyright and trademark uh, yes. litigation. Yeah. So um, I'm entrusted by the partners to work with um, counsel, witnesses um, and experts, prepare matters um, throughout the life cycle of a matter before it goes to court or partic- may also settle. So being involved in every single stage of that. So that might be very early on advising on the prospects of suing or, or defending a claim, yeah. drafting letters of demand, um, entering into settlement negotiations early on. Mm-hmm. Then um, once the matter has been filed, filing the pleadings, mm-hmm. Um, and also preparing the evidence for court. So working closely with all the witnesses okay. and then obviously preparing the matters for trial as well. Right. Okay. And how do you think some of the key experiences at university influenced what you do today as a lawyer? Sure. Um, a lot of, I think, university really developed my critical thinking okay. sk- abilities, yeah. um, problem solving abilities and always thinking outside the box. So a lot of the cases that we're running, mm-hmm. the areas where there isn't a lot of legal precedent. Yeah. So always thinking, how can we apply traditional legal mm-hmm. concepts to an area that may not necessarily have been litigated over? Right. Um, so particularly um, the things like data, suing competitors yeah. who are accessing um mm-hmm a client's database is surreptitiously thinking yeah. about traditional legal principles and how we can apply them. So really your critical thinking and, and problem solving skills come into play. That's so interesting. And just kind of going back to your time in London, how did you find the, I guess, transition from what you were doing here in Sydney during school, law school, and jumping straight into intellectual property in mm. a different country? Mm. Yeah, it was challenging. Um, absolutely. Um, 
thankfully I had been working in litigation, insurance litigation for I think five or four or five years as a paralegal. So I had that litigation um, basis, Mm -hmm. but I didn't have the intellectual property experience. So I just really needed someone to kind of give me an give me a chance over there. Um, But the skills were really transferable, um, particularly um, litigation skills were transferable over there um, and very similar um, laws in England to Australia. So it wasn't uh, as much of a challenge. Yeah. Um, But I think having the passion in the subject matter really helped me and and really pushed me along to, um, yeah, really sink my teeth into intellectual property. Uh, Interesting. And in your like role now, do you do more litigation or advisory work? Yeah, so my entire um, role is litigation. Okay. Um, but our yeah. team is a full serve has a full service offering. So we yeah. um, have commercial lawyers who advise mm-hmm. on high end licensing and IP commercialization. Okay. Um, across the full broad spectrum of IP rights, so being oh. copyright, trademarks, and patents. Yeah. Um, we also have a trademark prosecution team who do okay. high end trademark portfolios for lots of different brands including big international brands but specifically I I, um, I'm a litigator I'm in the blood sport Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) um what do you think are the key differences between like litigation and advising clients um, well, we have an advisory capacity at, yeah. as a litigator as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some big differences between being a litigator and, and being a commercial uh, lawyer. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not a commercial lawyer, so I can't really comment. But um, for me, I mean, I like the, I like the pace, the yeah. fast pace of litigation and mm-hmm. things coming in and pleadings being served and having yeah. to react to that, um, having to keep really calm under pressure, right. having to... Um, problem solve when you're sometimes in a very, very high pressure situation with, you know, an urgent interlocutory injunction has Mm -hmm. just been filed against your client. So uh, it's almost like a crisis management skill set versus um, some of my colleagues who do high-end commercial drafting. So they may be drafting a 500-page contract Mm -hmm. that takes them, you know, a few months to draft. Um, they need a lot of patience <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, I think I'm someone who works well under pressure. So litigation is yeah. much more suited to my personality. Right. Okay. So it just depends on, I guess, an individual's personality and also whether the pace of work as well. Is that right? Or yeah, absolutely. Is it also very fast in advising? Yeah. I mean, I think it comes down to, to what you enjoy and okay. some people, um, they love, scoping out a hu- how a huge contract is going to look and, right. and, and you know, it's more like project-based. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, for me personally, I like the, the yeah. high intense pressure <laughs> yeah. of things happening and having right. to go to court yeah. and thinking quickly and mm. calmly. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Um, just kind of diving more into intellectual property, mm-hmm. property now, what is the difference between the different areas? Like for example, trademarks and copyrights and patents, like, how do they all fit together? Yeah, so intellectual property is the kind of the umbrella term for mm. um, the law protecting intangible assets. So okay. the law recognising that, you know, um, products of human intellect should also be protected mm-hmm. just as how physical assets for are sure. also protected. Yeah. So then you've got the different um, types of intellectual property. Mm-hmm. So copyright um, protects the um, interne- intellectual creation of authors mm-hmm. of original creative works. So that might be something traditional like a book or a poem or mm-hmm. um, a sound recording, a musical work, but it also encompasses things like source code, which is protected by copyright as a literary work. Okay. So it also encompasses things that are in, um, I don't know if you term it, new technologies. Yeah. Um, then you've got trademarks, which protects mm. symbols, logos, um, slogans, um, and brands, and right. gives the owner a monopoly right to be able okay. to use that brand um, to the exclusion of all other traders. Yeah. Then you've got patents, which protects inventions um, by authors okay. as well. Okay. Um, you've also got design rights, which protects industrial designs. Um, and there are some other kind of periphery types of um, intellectual property rights that. that that we also kind of um, advise on and protect as well. They're the main types. All right, really interesting to learn about the differences. Um, kind of looking at the key legislations then, what is something that, or what's the key piece of legislation that you deal mm-hmm. with on the day-to-day basis? Yeah, so they're subject matter specific legislation. So I'd be dealing primarily with the Copyright Act and the Trademarks Act. 
uh, and my colleagues also deal with the Patents Act. Um, in addition, we deal a lot with the Australian Consumer Law, which goes hand in hand with um, protecting um, people's reputation in their brands and also um, when people make um, misrepresentations about mm. companies. So a lot of the time we are suing um, based on misrepresentations under the consumer law. We also, um, not that it's legislation, but a lot of our claims um, involve breaches of contract, mm. breaches of confidential information. So you might have an employee leaving a business and taking whole bunch of materials with them, including confidential information. So looking at both common law and equitable um, breach of confidence. Um, so there's all these other little smaller types of claims that we look at as well, but the main legislation is the subject matter specific okay. legislation. So in terms of the clients that you face, um, what are the key groups if you can group them? Sure. Well, intellectual property laws um, affect a broad spectrum. It affects really everyone. Um, so we have a really broad spectrum of client basis. Um, I protect everyone from entertainment clients, um, you know, musicians, creative people, through to financial businesses and banks who mm. may um, have created uh, websites and apps and have a lot of um, source code that they need protected or digital assets. Mm. I mean, most companies these days, data is the most valuable asset. So it, uh, intellectual property really is protects every single business. So yeah. we ended up by extension having a really broad range of clients. Okay. And obviously a lot of the stuff here is on the digital space and it goes across different countries. How do you think intellectual property law differs across these countries and how do you make sure that these rights are protected yeah. globally? Sure. So in Australia, we have national set of intellectual mm -hmm. property laws. Um, so, and businesses are expected to be familiar with those intellectual property laws, but they um, obviously apply Australia wide. Yeah. Um, other countries obviously have their own specific intellectual property laws, um, but they generally follow a lot of the same principles mm. um, as our intellectual property laws, but they may have different applications from time to time, different defences that are raised. Um, for example, in America, they've got different um, defences to copyright law. Okay. Um, and um, some, but some international IP laws actually have some unexpected common foundations. So mainland Chinese IP law is actually modelled off German IP law. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, so there are some yeah. similarities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so there's always a global perspective for us as IP lawyers um, advising clients mm -hmm. um, in obviously a very, um, you know, global business world. Um, and so we have to understand how those laws work internationally, but we work very closely with overseas IP lawyers, um, advising clients on, you know, how to exploit their licensing in different countries. We also advise, I mean, I recently advised a client um, who had had successful proceedings in the UK high court um, on a copyright case, whether they should bring a similar action in Australia. So we are very aware of how the laws interact um, and have to work very closely with overseas counsel as well. Okay, so it is more of a global effort compared to other areas of law. I think so, yes. So you mentioned about like new technology earlier on in, in our conversation. How does that differ from like more traditional companies in terms of protection or is, is there a difference? Yeah, I mean, I think IP law protects all traditional companies as well as new technologies. Yeah. Um, and new kind of startups and, and disruptors. But I think what, what we've seen is that some of the new technologies and, and the disruptors have been able to utilise IP law more to their advantage. Um, and, you know, particularly we've seen some examples where they've been able to thwart competitors coming into the space by... Um, by, you know, through IP law. Um, and we've seen obviously how well Uber has been a disruptor yeah. in the taxi industry and, and utilised um, data as an asset um, and it just kind of left the taxi industry behind. Mm -hmm. So we've definitely started to see that um, and who has really been able to thrive and utilise IP law to be able to thrive. Um, but I think on the whole, IP law doesn't tend to be the reason why a business would either succeed or fail. Okay, right. And speaking of like lots of disruptors and things like that, nowadays there's lots of freelancers and contractors um, working for larger companies. So in terms of their rights, uh, do they belong? So the things that they create, do they belong to the company that they're, I guess, contracted 
at or for, don't know what the phrasing is there, but, um, or does it belong to the individual that creates them? Yes, well, it will always come down to a case-by-case basis, but it will depend on the terms of their the contractor's agreement. Usually a contractor would maintain ownership of the copyright and anything they create, but obviously if they're being paid by a company to create it, then there may be an assignment of the IP to the company. Mm. Um, So, you know, for all contractors out there, they need to be, um, and for businesses as well, they need to be really clear about what, uh, who owns the rights. Um, And particularly when you're entering into those situations, we have a lot of clients who kind of come with these questions of, you know, do I have the rights to do this and exploit this or, um, and vice versa from the perspective of the um, of the contractor. So it's always wise to be documenting everything very clearly going in. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's very easy to end up in litigation yeah. over who owns the rights and who can exploit them. And what advice would you give for, say, like a regular uni student who has like a side hustle um, to protect their rights? Like what are the key things to look for in the contracts? Um Always making sure there's a clear definition of what the work is that's being created and uh, who who maintains the ownership of that. If it's being licensed, the terms around the license. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really <laughs> going to come down to an individual basis. Yeah, but, I mean, fair. I think in the context of um, people promoting themselves online, being really aware that if you own the rights to something before you publish it online – because you may not actually own the rights to something and you may end up that that, that could be it constitute an infringement of someone's intellectual property rights, mm. a business's intellectual property rights, being really aware of that, being really aware of anything you post on social media may, due to the terms and conditions of the platform, may actually end up being owned by Facebook or Instagram, um, who as soon as you post content to those platforms yeah. may automatically own or have ownership rights in the images that you post or the content you post. So being really mindful of that. Basically ensuring that before you take any step that you know that you have clear definitive rights to do that step because obviously once it's published out there then um, it's very easy to, for someone to sue or, or to bring yeah. a claim um, and even if you delete it um, there's ways that we can, we're able to search and look online and, and find evidence of the infringement. So just being really certain of the rights you have before you post. Yeah, and I think that's important to know because I think everything that's posted onto the internet is like even if you do delete it, it's easy to find or it's easy to recover. Yes. That's important. Um, So in terms of, I guess, for small businesses then, um, a lot of the times they're using platforms like TikTok or like Facebook to kind of try and quote-unquote blow up. Mm. Um, And a lot of their designs and things like that do get stolen inevitably because of the lack of protection around that. So what do you think or how do you see the law catering to that in the future or even presently? So just in terms of um, like uh, with small businesses posting stuff online and uh, from what I could see is a lot of their designs and things get stolen by like larger companies because these smaller companies don't have the resources to I guess, copyright their designs or, or things like that. So how do you think like the law is trying to help this area or if there is any mm. help at all? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So copyright automatically protects the uh, an original creative work that is distilled in material form. So even doesn't matter if you're a small business or an individual, um, you automatically have the rights and, and they're your rights ahead of time, ahead of the other company who steals it. So obviously... You would have a claim if a company comes and steals it, but um, it's difficult, obviously, when there's huge companies who have unlimited resources doing this thing. And I know it's happened quite a few times with companies like fashion companies taking people's designs and creative works. And, you you know, you hear about it in the news, um, but, you know, the original author does have rights. Right. Um, and there are some um, smaller firms out there um, and some resources that you can refer to if you, if that does happen to you. Mm-hmm. For example, Arts Law is a really great organisation who protect um, a lot of creative people who don't have a lot of money um, and, and how they can control um, and bring claims against these kind of bigger companies who may steal their designs. But it's a, it's a tough one because you, yeah. you do have own the rights to it and you should be able to post things online um, and, you know, promote your brand and promote your works. 
Um, but we live in a day and age where, yes. unfortunately, <laughs> these bigger companies take them. Um, I don't know if there's the law, if there's a solution. I can't think of one that the law could assist smaller owners of copyright works better. Um, but, yeah, I mean, always yeah. it's a good idea to use a copyright symbol um, yeah. and keep contemporaneous records of when you've created the work that you can use to prove later on when you created it, the process of how you created it. Mm. Um, and it's just evidence basically to prove that you are the first original creator that you could use in any claim that you brought against a bigger company. Okay, so keeping log of everything yes. is kind of the key, right? Um, and just kind of finishing up, um, what sort of advice would you give for law students now who want to pursue IP law? Like what sort of subjects did you take in uni and um, what sort of career steps did you do as well to get to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a really small niche area, intellectual property law. Um, if you're interested, I'd absolutely recommend taking all intellectual property subjects at university. Um, I know I took copyright designs and patents. I think they were separate subjects when I was at university. Taking consumer law subjects is also really handy and goes hand in hand with a lot of the claims that we're running. Um, but I think one of the biggest types of law that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is contract law. Um and obviously that's <laughs> that's mandatory yeah. uni, but I think you have to have a really good understanding of contract law and how it works to work in intellectual property. Obviously, intellectual property is also a tort. Mm. So understanding um, the principles of tort and particularly joint tort fees, we look at that a lot mm. and play that in many of our cases and things like um, common design when people, are, um, you know, there's conspiracies to commit different infringements of intellectual property. Yeah. That's a really interesting area that comes up a lot in, in the cases that we're running. Um, so, yeah, there's absolutely subject-specific matters, but at the same time we have a lot of graduates join our team who have no background in, okay. in the specific copyright areas, I'm sorry, specific intellectual property areas, um, and they just really love it, really love the area, and, um, yeah, you kind of learn the content on the job. But... Um, I think it's good to have a um, real passion for the subject matter. Uh, we also work a lot in entertainment law, so mm. that kind of goes hand in hand as well. So defamation and media law, um, as well as an area that we see a lot of our grads have come from at uni. Yeah. Wow, that's so interesting as well. And I think after having this conversation with you, it does it definitely kind of piqued my own interest in, in this area as well. What's the most interesting case you've worked on? <laughs> Oh, it's so hard to pick. So we run so many groundbreaking cases in our team. Um, even last week, our team was in the High Court in Canberra um, on a trademark comparative advertising case. Um, but the most interesting case I've been involved in uh, would be the Loves in the Air case, which is the landmark decision on music composition copyright in Australia. So my clients were sued by the copyright owners of the song Lovers in the Air. Um, my clients are a small indie duo from Portland, Oregon, um, and they wrote a song that used the words loves in the air. And there's not, there hasn't been many cases at all on musical copyright. And this one um, ran for a few years. We recently settled. We were hoping that it would, um, we would overturn it on appeal, but um, the matter settled. But um, the judge was just this perim and he created a completely new area of copyright law, musical copyright law. So usually literary works and musical works are considered separately under the Copyright Act. So the lyrics and the music are considered separately, but he created a new kind of um, musical copyright where the sound of the sung lyric forms part of the musical composition. So the actual phonetic singing is part of the music, not just the lyrics. So that's been a really interesting case and it's completely changed musical mm -hmm. copyright um, and we'll see if it gets overturned by someone else in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but that's been a really fascinating case yeah. to work on um, and I was able to utilise my musical background as well to help with um, preparing experts' reports mm -hmm. with musicologists and analysing the music mm -hmm. um, and going hand in hand with how the legal claim is pleaded out. So that was, yeah, extremely yeah. interesting. Yeah, that is super interesting because I know um, sampling is a big thing in, yes. in different songs and things like that. So it would be interesting to see how that 
plays out and yes yeah. exactly yes so sampling is a weird area of copyright yeah. law which seems to be an exception but yeah. um yeah there needs to be a proper sampling case I think yeah I only mentioned this because I like to write music myself oh, as okay. well yeah so I work with a producer and things like that so it's really interesting to hear that there are there are actually things that I probably need to hear by or other musicians need to hear by as well. So, yes. yeah, thank you. Um, just kind of as a final question, um, a f- bit of a fun one. What are some of your interests outside of, u- uh, not uni, sorry, outside of law and work and how do you think that helps with work-life balance as well? Sure. Um, well, I obviously love the creative arts, but that hasn't been made clear. So I try and attend as many concerts and plays I can go to. Um, we do a lot of work, pro bono work as well at the firm and particularly in the creative arts. Um, so trying to support things like Langara Dance Company um, and going to chamber music ensembles. I play in the Lloyd's Orchestra, which is wow. fun and still lets me have that creative release of my professional musical career that never happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my job is pretty crazy. As I said, yeah. it's a bit of a blood sport. So um, particularly to avoid burnout and managing work-life balance, um, a lot of it is hanging with my dog and my husband and going swimming, going for walks and just really enjoying that we live in a harbour city where we have beautiful walks that we can do. So um, yeah, absolutely. You have to have a work-life balance, um, particularly working from in a firm where, you know, it's a very demanding career. Thank you so much for your time today, Natalie. It was a pleasure meeting you and you've definitely given us a lot of insights about IP law. And I think this is actually maybe an area that I want to go into now. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Insights by UNSW Law Society. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast so that you don't miss out on any future episodes.